Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Great. Happy to hear that? Good. I would like to thank everyone for coming out to the 2015 SBA Lecture Series. Today we have the amazing pleasure of bringing up Senator Sharon Weston Broom from the Louisiana Legislature. And she will be, absolutely, please give her a round of applause, yes. And today she will be speaking on the Christian case for social justice. Once again, I would like to remind everyone that the, the vision and the mission of the SBA Lecture Series is to bring dynamic speakers on topics that are both practical and relevant. So without further ado, I would like to bring Ms. Venice Morgan up, who will give Ms. Sharon Weston, <laughs> Senator Sharon Weston Broom her introduction. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Benice Morgan, and it is an honor and a privilege to introduce Senator Sharon Weston Broom and to tell y'all just a little bit about her. Uh, Senator Broom's role as a public servant has spanned over 25 years. Broom currently serves as President Pro Tempore of the Louisiana State Senate, and Senator Broom served in Louisiana served in the Louisiana House of, Res uh, of in the House of uh, Representatives, District 29 for 12 years and was the first female elected as Speaker Pro Tempore of the Louisiana House. Broom is the only woman to serve in a ranking leadership position in the House and the Senate. During her tenure in the legislature, Senator Broom has been a vocal advocate for issues surrounding children and families. Her passion is reflected in a number of bills she has authored over the years, including the Children's Trust Fund Bill, Kinship Care Subsidy Program, Arts and Education, uh, and Human Trafficking Victim Assistance Fund. Senator Brown has led initiatives to protect victims against domestic violence and has been honored by the Louisiana Coalition Against the Domestic Violence. Her most recent victory was Act 456, which, pr which protects victims of domestic violence against housing discrimination. She is a recipient of the Morehouse College Gandhi King Ikeda Community Builders Award, as well as the 2014 NAACP of Baton Rouge Lifetime Achievement Award. Now with two degrees in communication, Senator Broom has established herself as a nationally recognized speaker and communications consultant. She is the president of Sharon Broom Communications Incorporated, and in addition, she served for five years as the Two on your side reporter for WBRC TV, which is ABC Baton Rouge. She is an active member of Star Hill Baptist Church. Senator Broom is happily married to Alonzo Broom, and they are the proud parents of three children and grandchildren. And just like any great leader, this seasoned legislator is in her last term as a state senator, but looks forward to pursuing much higher aspirations. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a very warm Southern University Law student welcome to Senator Sharon Weston Group. Thank you very much. I often say that that introduction uh, usually longer than my presentation. But I am excited to uh, be here this afternoon, and I want to thank Denise and the rest of the student organization for uh, inviting me. Uh, one little piece of information that Denise left out, I don't know if it was on purpose, but she served as one of my legislative interns uh, when she was in undergraduate school. So I like to think that I had some type of influence on her. All the positive things about her, you can attribute to her mother and me, okay? The other things were not responsible. But I'm real excited to be here today because a Southern University Law Center has produced a significant number of attorneys who are involved in the drafting and framing of public policy at the Louisiana State Legislature. And so while I am not an attorney, I believe that my background and the background of other non-attorneys at the legislature add value to the equation of representative democracy. And so another reason I'm glad to be here is I just really simply enjoy the classroom. I love to teach. In fact, for years I've been teaching a course 
in the uh, Mass Comm Department at Southern University, African Americans and Media. It is uh, taught only one semester and it can be used as part of the African American experience requirements at the undergraduate school. So I'm very energized when I'm in the classroom. I find it's a, a reciprocal process, right? It reminds me of one of India Ari's song, Better People. Anybody ever heard of that? Where she says there are skirts of information that you can only get in conversations when young people who talk to old people, it would make us better people all around. And if old people would talk to young people, it would make us better people all around. And so with that said, let's begin our conversation today. Franklin Roosevelt once said, in these difficult days, we Americans everywhere must and shall choose the path of social justice, the path of faith, the path of hope, and the path of love toward our fellow man. And so while that was said during the era probably of the Great Depression, with which Roosevelt is responsible for escorting the nation out of, I believe it is a quote that could probably be applicable to many of our presidents. Um, as it relates to Sharon Weston Broom, I, I will just share with you, since we're talking about the case for Christian, the Christian case for social justice, that I am a committed Christian. And as you heard, I've served uh, actually 27 years in elected office. Uh, 24 years in the state legislature. And so while I have never really followed or, or established a personal legislative agenda, I have to say that much of the legislation that I have authored was either birthed from or connected to my Christian convictions. In fact, in my bio you heard uh, Denise talk about that many of the pieces of legislation that I have authored were driven by my passion, right? And so my faith and belief system are not a hat that I take on and off as I move throughout the world in various arenas. Rather, they are the internal fabric of my life, the principles that remain constant, that mold and shape me into the woman that I am. So the Bible is my handbook for life. And the Bible makes social justice a mandate of faith and really a basic characteristic of Christianity. For example, Proverbs 31, 8, 9 states, Speak up for the people who have no voice, for the rights of all the down and otters. Speak out for justice. Stand up for the poor and destitute. Micah 6, 8. But he's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. And so social justice has its biblical roots in a triune God and time and time again shows his love and compassion for the weak, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the disinherited. You get the picture. And so author Time Dearborn writes, for Christians, the pursuit of social justice for the poor and oppressed is the decisive mark of being people who submit to the will and way of God. Now, justice from a biblical perspective is defined as the ability to make it right. To make right. One of the most notable social justice Christians was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His thoughts on social justice are perhaps summarized in the following quote from a speech that he gave in 1963 at Western Michigan University. The topic was social justice and the emerging new age. Dr. King said, all I'm saying is simply this, that all life is interrelated, that somehow we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever 
affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. You can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. Now, while Dr. King emphasizes personal charity, reaching out and offering response to your neighbor, in the same speech, he speaks to the role of government policy in social justice. Listen to this quote. He said, now the other myth that gets around is the idea that legislation cannot really solve the problem and that it has no great role to play in the period of social change because you've got to change the heart and you can't change the heart through legislation. You can't legislate morals. The job must be done through education and religion. Well, there is half-truth involved here, says Dr. King. Certainly, if the problem is to be solved, then in the final sense, hearts must be changed. Religion and education must play a great role in changing the heart. But we must go on to say that while it may be true that morality cannot be legislated, behavior can be regulated. It may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. It may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, but it can keep him from lynching me. And I think that that is pretty important also. So there is a need for executive orders. There is a need for judicial decrees. There is a need for civil rights legislation on the local scale, within states, and on the national scale from the federal government. And so as I thought about the words of Dr. King and thought about our topic today, I thought it would be good for me to give you an up-close and personal look at some of the legislation that I have passed, some that didn't pass, I'll tell you about those, over the 24 years that I've been in the legislature. Now, what I did was kind of just narrow it down to about 10 years, maybe, because uh, there are a deluge of bills, as you well know. And if you have 24 years of bills, that's a, that's a lot of bills. If you, ever, if you ever want to find out more specifically, I can direct you to the uh, legislative website. But I'm going to talk about a few bills and then talk about my motivation for doing these bills. However, I believe, based on what I've already shared with you, that you will probably identify the motivation for me doing these bills. For example, let's start here. Just this year, Act 248 I passed, which prohibits suspension or expulsion of students in grades pre-kindergarten through five for certain uniform violations. Well, that bill did not start, start out just dealing with uniform violations. Actually, it started out eliminating suspensions and expulsions for children from get grades K through three, right? A narrow, very narrow category. But guess what? I started getting so much flat from educators who said, you don't know how these children act in the classroom. We need to be able to suspend them. What do you think the motivation for me doing that bill was? Well, I'll tell you. The motivation for me doing the bill is that if you know anything about juvenile justice, if you know anything about the uh, school to prison pipeline, then you'll know that it starts with labeling a child with suspensions and expulsions at an early age. Social justice. Act 456, which you heard Venice mention, provides certain accommodations upon reasonable documentation presented by domestic abuse victims who lease residential dwellings. That was a bill that I had worked on last year. This year we finally got it passed. And I don't have to tell you about the uh, plague of domestic violence that is in the state of Louisiana. Unfortunately, almost every week you hear about victims of domestic violence. And unfortunately, these victims are being killed. But so many times when people are in a state of trying to get out of a situation, if they have experienced that, then the landlord doesn't want anything happening. So there has been a history of evictions. 
that have taken place for victims, the marginalized, of domestic violence. Act 445, I uh, did it last year, mandates inclusion of lymphedema treatment as an option in health insurance coverage. Well, if you look, does anybody know anybody who's ever had breast cancer? Okay. A group of women who had breast cancer and our survivors came to me. And they started educating me on the fact that after they uh, have had surgery in many instances or treatment, that their arm starts to swell up. And that there's a sleeve that can be put on their arm to help minimize the swelling. But guess what? The insurance companies were not covering them. And so I took on their issue and went to uh, the State Department of Insurance and started talking with insurers and got them on my side because if you know anything about the legislature, people hate mandates. You know, a, lot of, a lot of people hate mandates, right? But because this was one of the issues that, just like you raised your hand, so many people could identify with, and I remember the chair of the insurance committee in the House coming to me and saying that his wife had had um, uh, breast cancer and whatever I could do to help you. And so this was a hard issue, right? Helping someone. Act 429, 2013, human trafficking. You all know how big that is becoming not only uh, here in Louisiana, it's an issue, but nationally and internationally. Act 854, I did in 2012, requires the consideration of certain poverty impact issues and an issuance of a poverty impact statement prior to the adoption, amendment, or repeal of rules by a state agency. You just heard the quote from Dr. Martin Luther King that talked about the interrelatedness, right, of humanity. You know where Louisiana ranks in terms of poverty, right? And so what are we doing down there at the legislature to reduce and minimize poverty in the state of Louisiana? Well, I authored this bill to see what our policies are doing as a state to really attack poverty. That was Act 854, Act 685. I did in 2012, requires that notice and election form be provided to um, the fetal heart beat be made audible to and an ultrasound image be displayed for review by a pregnant woman prior to an abortion. Sometimes a controversial issue. I believe that women should be equipped with every piece of information possible before they have a life altering uh, make a life altering health decision such as abortion. And I believe this information provides them with that. I look forward to questions to that. Yes. Um, HB 99, I, I went way back to find this because I had this, you know, bright this thought. I was like, oh yeah, light bulb. In 2003, I authored HB 99. It didn't pass, but guess what? It, the, uh, uh, the bill did. It permitted nursing home residents or the resident's legal representative to monitor the resident through the use of electronic monitoring devices. I'm sure you've heard stories of the aged or those who are, have been in nursing homes and nursing home abuse that has taken place. So I thought, okay, let's, let's get some cameras in there and see what's going on and the family could monitor it. Well, I, I, I was adamantly opposed by the nursing home industry on that bill, so it did not pass the legislature. In uh, 2004, I did House Concurrent Resolution 207, which requested a study relative to protecting Louisiana citizens from predatory lending practices. In uh, 2004, I also passed Act 775, which sets maximum fees that may be charged by check cashers. And lastly, Act 1374, I passed in 1997. That was as far back as I could go on the computer when I was doing my research. I've been here since 92. But I, I wanted to go back because some of my 
uh, legislation that I passed in my early years had to do with grandparents who were raising grandchildren. Because Louisiana is fourth in the nation of grandparents who are raising grandchildren. I met this group of people, became their advocate in the legislature, and ever since I've been there, I've been trying to fine-tune legislation to empower them. Grandparents who are taking on children because of societal ills, such as drug abuse in a family, uh, uh, incarceration, etc., and the grandparents are stepping up to the plate to take children in a, a time when they're retired and on a fixed income. So later on, that legislation, which started out for grandparents, evolved into kinship care. Because if you can place a child in adoption with a non-family member, then I think you should be able to place a child with someone next of kin and they be offered the same services. So in closing, as I prepare for your questions, faith leader Dr. Tony Evans said this, our government is in desperate need of people who can inject righteousness and justice into our political bloodstream. For a society can never rise above the quality of its leadership. Thank you, Professor Gerard. All right, now what we're going to do is moderate uh, questions. We have questions for uh, Senator Groom. Uh, I would also like to remind you to keep your questions, uh, your questions brief or your comments brief. I'll just have to make sure that everybody uh, gets their question asked and we'll come right back around. Hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for all of your social justice efforts at the Peace and the Legislature. I can only imagine the uphill battle that you face in such a conservative state with a lot of this really awesome legislation. Um, we heard from Senator Gillery last week um, on his switch from um, uh, Democrat to Republican, and he said that his basis for that switch was based on values, right? And I, um, I think that your case and his case both, I think, equally find yourselves in situations where you're kind of close to the fence, right? Where you're, you have um, maybe some Christian values that kind of more align with a conservative mindset, but you're an advocate for social justice. And this is something that I agree with. I also am a, a evangelical Christian who is a social justice advocate, and it can be really difficult to find a place in politics when that's kind of your abuse, and I feel like a lot of people fall into that middle ground category. So how do you make the distinction, and what, you know, um, keeps you, I guess, aligned with the political party, and how do you kind of navigate with that? That's a very good question, and I think everybody heard that. Um, there, well, I'm not going to talk about the values that Senator Gilbert and I share, I'll just talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the truth is, let's talk about it from a, a party perspective, because you use the word, uh, conservative. And um, while I tend to stray away from labels, because I like to think of myself, even though I'm a Democrat, as an independent free thinker, right?